Are you a mother, father, or you are involved in caring for children? If yes, then listen to Ask the Pediatricians every Thursday by 10 a.m. for insightful discussion on popular child health topics such as dangerous child health practices, immunizations, infant feeding, developmental milestones, and so much more. You also get to ask questions on these topics and listen to answers to real life child health issues by and pediatrician. listen to answers to real life child health issues by a pediatrician. To health education and information of parents. Get to health education and information of parents. Get to Okay, good day everyone and you're welcome to ATPR on Fresh Waves Radio. We are glad to have Dr. Gwimisola with us live on Fresh Waves Radio. Um, you're welcome Dr. Gwim and Boye Day, you're welcome again. Another beautiful time for Ask the Pediatrician on Fresh Waves Radio. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning, everyone. And thank you so much, Alpha. And thank you so much, Alpha. <laughs> All right, I think we're having a lot of echo. Right. Right. I think we're having a lot of echo. Echo? Yeah. All right. Also, good morning to those who are watching on Instagram. You can only see me, <laughs> but you can't see Esther, but I think the rest can, those who are watching on Facebook or YouTube, you can, um, you can see us. All right. So I think the echo is gone now. So you can drop your questions. So today is not any, we're not talking about any particular topic. We're just going to take all your questions and answers for the next one hour. So if you have any questions, you can drop it under the videos or you can send it into the studio or you can drop it on instagram and we will try and do justice to them in the next uh, one hour that we have on this program all right thank you so much everyone for joining us this morning yeah we are glad to have you okay so I think we our, our our viewers are still getting ready to drop your questions. So I will just do a little bit of uh, introduction of Axi Pediatrician. Getting ready to drop your questions. So I will just okay. So um, Axi Pediatrician Foundation is a nonprofit organization that is committed to the health and well-being of all children globally, but especially in sub-Saharan Africa where majority of children die before the age of five. And we do that through our health education and information programs, and as well through our community medical outreaches. So this program is actually one of our ways of supporting parents uh, to ensure that they know how to take care of their children and so that our children do not die from preventable uh, causes of death. So um, actually beyond this program, if you have any questions from Mondays to Saturdays, you can post your questions on our Facebook group. And uh, we have about four of them. Ask the pediatrician is a popular one. It's for children health issues. And for adult health issues, we have the ATP family, for first-time mother, we have the FCM baby care. And for those who have been bereaved in one way or the other, we have the ATP Silly Mom group. So you are welcome to post your questions from Mondays to Saturdays on any of these groups. And you can be assured that your questions will be answered by healthcare professionals, you know, during, uh, uh, so you are sure the, evidence, the information you are getting uh, evidence-based information. Okay, so, and of course, we also do one-on-one uh, -on -one for those who want to have private sections through our ATP clinics. So those are the ways that which we support parents and families in, in terms of the health of our children. So thank you so much for joining us. All right, I think we've started having questions, so we can just start. Okay, this is coming from Gudi Amarachi. Thank you, doctors, for this opportunity. What causes black bots in children despite applying cream on it? Is there a cure or remedy for it? 
Okay, thank you, Godi Hamarachi, for joining us. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, I really would have loved to ask you a few more questions to be clear what you meant. So are you saying that the, the buttocks of your children, the skin looks black? And then the question is, was your baby born that way? Because there are certain things we call uh, bat marks. So there are some bat marks babies are born with, and it does not mean it's a disease. It's just <laughs> normal. So and the, what I'm thinking of, the one you're referring to, the is referring most likely, to is most a, likely. a bat mark. And that is what we call... Uh, Mongolian blue spots, uh, it tends to make either the black, the bottom just be black. But the baby is actually born that way. Born and that there's way. nothing you can do. And there's nothing you can do. You don't need to apply any cream. You don't need to apply um, uh, any products on it. You should leave it alone and that's it. So if that is what you meant, then it is a birthmark and you don't really need to apply anything on that. But if that's not what you meant, uh maybe your baby already has a normal skin before and then you didn't tell us the age of the child please when you're asking questions try and always tell us the age of the child so we know <laughs> the background situation and then if if it's if it's something that happened maybe much much later then we really need to see the child to know what is causing that and then we can now uh, tell you whether there's a skin particular skin condition and the appropriate treatment for that but otherwise you don't really need to uh, do anything if the baby was born that way and just leave it alone uh, is there something you can do about it i hope that is if that's if that's if you want to clarify for that you are free to uh, ask, uh, add more um, information to that. All right, all that is helpful. Okay. Um, I think I, I can go I and take I, a I question, from, question Instagram. from Instagram. Okay, so if I if I meet your mic, can you people see, hear me? Can you people see, hear me? And the echo will go down. Okay, okay. I will just your mic. All right. Um, I don't see any questions yet on um, Instagram. Okay, so if you have any question, feel free to drop your questions to further down, uh, so that we can take your questions. Okay. All right. I can see any question. I can see Goody is asking for that clarification. Um. Okay, she's saying that, um, yes, it was born that way. It will be six years old by October. Okay, doctor, thank you. All right, yeah, so I'm happy to hear that. Uh, so if it was born that way, just leave it alone. There's nothing you can do about it. You may want to see your doctors. They may be able to tell you. I'm only suspecting because I've not seen your child, but what I suspect is what we call that Mongolian blue spots. But if you really want to be sure what bath mark it is, you may want to see a pediatrician and then they can tell you, and you don't need to do anything about it. Sometimes it's just, that's just, some people call it beauty marks, some people call it bath marks. It is just the way a child is born. It doesn't mean anything and you don't need to do anything about it. So thank you so much for that, so clarification. You for that clarification. Okay. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I can't see any more questions. So if you have questions, please ask a question <laughs> time. Uh, people tend to leave their questions towards the end and then we begin to rush towards the end of the program. But if you have any questions, feel free to drop your questions now and we'll take them. Okay, I think another question just landed in. Okay, another question from Fatima Sambo. You're welcome, Fatima Sambo. Good morning, doctors. Please, can my four-year-old get his dental caries removed and his dental feeling okay for his age? Okay, thank you, uh, Fatima. That's a very important question. Uh, for those who don't know, when we talk about dental caries, we are talking about teeth 
that are decayed, you know, that have uh, like holes in them and things like that. So for children below the age of five years, uh, they, there are two sets of teeth that we all have. We have what we call the primary teeth or the mixed teeth, and then we have the permanent teeth. So the children below the age of the children below the age of five have the always have the the primary teeth or the uh, uh, meek teeth, as we also call them. So these teeth are going to come off anyway. They are going to start falling off, and then they will be replaced by the permanent teeth. So the teeth uh, from age of five to seven years, most children will start bringing out their teeth, and then it will be replaced by permanent teeth. So if your child already has the uh, dental caries in the meek teeth, Okay, the, the dentist can remove them. Okay, because I, I don't think they're going to feel them. They are likely just going to remove them because they know that the children are still going to bring out their permanent teeth. So because they're still going to bring out their permanent teeth, it's okay for them to remove them, but I'm not so sure whether they want to feel them. But you can see your dentist and then they can advise you further, you know, because they know that those teeth are going to come out anyway and then they'll be replaced by... Uh, the permanent teeth. But more importantly than removing the teeth or filling them or all that is the fact that what makes the children to have these uh, dental caries, we have to guard against it because you can imagine that if the baby now has the permanent teeth and those ones also get uh, um, uh, dental caries, then it becomes more challenging for the child. So what are the things that are leading to dental caries? Is you no. Know, taking sweet things and then not properly you know brushing our teeth so we need to make sure our children they eat healthy food we should take away all the sweets all the you know things that we like children to eat all the sweets and all that they are the things that tend to predispose them to dental caries so even so and even if i thought they eat sweets maybe occasionally you need to make sure that they brush their teeth very well they have to brush it twice in a day morning and after morning and night before they go to bed so if you do that that will reduce the chances of the teeth when the child eventually have the permanent teeth also having dental caries because when they have dental caries in the permanent teeth then they there's no other alternative they have to either fill one or they have to be replaced um with dentures and all that which will not be accepted which i mean for that age so i think that's what i would recommend so just to the dentist and then they can take it up and take there. it up there. All right. I think I have another question on Instagram. Uh, okay. I actually have about two of them on Instagram. For those on Facebook, you can just listen. You won't see the question displayed. Uh, uh, just let me read them out. Uh, Miss... Mr. Zemiri 8, sorry if I didn't pronounce that well. I said, good morning, man. Thanks for all you do. My baby is six months old. Best weight is 2.55. Current weight is nine kilos. Baby is about six months old. Okay, was born at 35 weeks. Does it mean he won't attain the milestone he's supposed to? Uh, okay, so uh, I, I think you are talking, are you talking about developmental milestones? And okay, obviously, number one, your baby's weight is a little bit on the high side for a baby that was born pre term and it's just six months old. The baby normally should double their birth weight at six months, but your baby is already uh, almost uh, tripling the weight, if I can put it that way. So please watch what how you feel the baby. I know some baby, mothers sometimes when our babies are born pre term and they're born within their weights are small we just want to quickly feed them feed them so that they can be big you know we really don't want that you know being the extreme of everything is not good we want babies to gain weight but we also don't want them to gain too much weight okay so i worry definitely about the weight of a nine kg in a six month old i know you are just doing uh, most likely you are doing formula feeding so try not to overfeed the baby as well from six months, you can start them on complementary feeding. Now, babies that are born pre term are prone to certain uh, difficulties. Number one, when we talk about milestones for them, developmental milestones in pre term babies, we have to do it based on their on the way on the on the correct set age so most of us always calculate like for example you show me your baby is six months old that is a chronological age of your baby the age based on the dates of birth of the baby but for us as pediatricians when we are looking at that child's uh 
growth and development, we look at it from the uh, develop uh, what we call the corrected age. So because your baby was born five weeks earlier, because the normal date is 40 weeks. So if your baby was born at 35 weeks, your baby was born five weeks earlier than the normal time. So at least one month and one week earlier. So for your six month old baby, the corrected age is actually four months and three weeks, you know. So that is a corrected age. So if you're looking at that baby, I'm, I'm going to be looking at that baby's development from the perspective of what do I expect from a four months and three weeks old baby, not from a six months old baby. The same thing with the weight. So that is why I was worried about the weight of the baby because the baby is just four week, four months and three weeks, you know, just around five weeks. So if baby was born about one month earlier, so that baby's weight should not be nine kilos. That's the weight of a nine nine month old. And then the babies, I expect babies to have like neck control, and the baby should be able to say. So it's, it's not every preterm baby that we have developmental delay. In fact, most of them do not. But the lower the uh, the gestational age and the weight of the baby, the higher the risk. So, for example, babies that are born less than 28 weeks, we are almost certain that 50% of them are going to have developmental delay or cerebral palsy and all that. But from 32 weeks above, most of them are actually fine. So your baby is 35 weeks. It's almost close to the normal time. So we are not expecting any problem. We are not. But depending on what's, what happened, why was the baby born preterm? What happened during the delivery? Did the baby cry? The baby has complications like jaundice. So there are many factors that are involved. But if your baby was born at a fair week, the baby was fine. There was no complication. The baby was born crying, no jaundice, no infection, no anything. We expect baby to have no more developmental milestones. But if baby has complications, then we will look out for those ones. And that is why for preterm babies, you must always follow, they must be followed up by the pediatricians. I know most, many of mothers, once our baby goes home, we think that's the end and we don't even bother. And even though the doctor has told you, come back and see me at two weeks, come back and see me at six weeks, we think, oh, we don't have time, the baby is fine. No, the pediatrician must follow up all preterm babies up to the age of two years minimum because we want to be sure that they recover fully from that prematurity and they, they don't have any complications. So your pediatrician, each time you go for follow-up, they are looking at the ways, they are looking at the developmental milestones so that they know that everything is fine. So I don't expect your baby to have any problem unless there are other complications. And that's why I say you need to be following up uh, with your pediatrician who will be able to tell you that as well. All right. Okay. So before we go back to Facebook, I also have one more question on Instagram from Shami for King. You say, good morning, doc. I thought baby's teeth supposed to come in pairs, um, but it's only one tooth that is coming. Okay. So when it comes to teeth and teeth, there are no um, formula like they must do this, they must follow this. I think parents get themselves unnecessarily worked up over teeth, okay, over the teeth scene. Number one, we don't, I think we've done, I've done a HTP hour on sitting and I will encourage you to go through that. It's available on our Facebook, YouTube, on my podcast as well. So teaching, it can happen. It doesn't have to follow any of our own preconceived ideas. So some people, for example, expect that the teeth should come out from the bottom first. And so if it, if they come out from the top first, then they're worried about it. It doesn't really matter. The teeth can come out. Majority of children will have their lower incisors or the lower teeth first. But some babies have their own upper teeth first. It doesn't matter. Some people expect that babies will start bringing out teeth from maybe five, six months. So babies may bring out their teeth when they were born. We have babies that are born with teeth. <laughs> so at the same time, we also have babies that may not bring out their first a set of teeth until they are one year old and above. So these things are variation. There are a lot of normal variation very widely. So, and it, like you want, you're saying now that they have to come out in pairs. No, they don't have to come out in pairs. So I've seen babies that will bring out one tooth and then it will take them for another one month to bring out another tooth. And I've seen babies that the first time they are going to bring out their teeth, they bring out everything, uh, at the same time, they bring out eight at, at once. You just wake up one morning and you find eight teeth in the mouth. So there are variation and variation. So 
it will save mothers a lot of heartaches and headaches if you just don't worry yourself about the teeth, okay? And just leave it. And as long and the dentist wants you to come and see them when your baby is one year old. So from the one year old, you can go see the dentist so they can always examine the teeth and make sure everything is fine. And they want to see you every six months. Um, so that's all, but there's no law or the, there are wide variation in how it happens what happens and all that so just don't worry about that i hope yeah there's no reason for you to worry about teeth and how often teeth comes out and all that all right i think that's uh uh for instagram so for instagram so we okay. i think we have, i think we have Okay, from oh, thank you so much, Dr. Mboede. And we are having from Fatima Sambo saying, Oh, thank you very much, Doctor. God bless you. I will feel relieved now that I know more about dental health. So thank you very much, Dr. Boyede. Okay, from Oluato saying Ola Umi Suzy. Good morning, Doctor. My three months old sweats excessively especially when she's breastfeeding her body becomes wet from head to toe is there anything to worry about okay thank you for okay. that thank you for <laughs> all right uh, so um there are a lot of factors that go into um sweating uh, especially number one it is okay for babies to sweat when they're breastfeeding because a lot of mothers ask that question all the time and uh and i always tell them when you also eat yourself especially when you are eating your hot food what do you do you sweat that is natural that is normal and if you don't know breast milk is actually hot it's actually hot food because it is coming from inside your body and it is coming from the internal temperature so it's a very hot food for the baby so that is why when they are eating and that is babies eating number one they're taking a food that is hot so they sweat number two they are it is a walk you know when you are eating you are using energy to suck and all that for the babies that is a major that's the most work they do that's sucking so that is why babies will have health problems they they struggle to solve because they don't have that energy to suck so um Sucking for babies is work. Is they spend energy on it? The food itself is warm or us, if you like, and so definitely they can sweat. So there's absolutely nothing, nothing to worry about in a child who is sweating. So and then when parents use the word like excessive, then the question is how did you calculate what is excessive? Or from what is normal so for example how do you know when sweating is excessive or not so a lot of the time parents use those words because that is based on what you think so you think a baby should not sweat at all when they're breastfeeding so if baby sweating when they're breastfeeding you think that's excessive that is not excessive so a baby can sweat when they're breastfeeding okay for us we worry a baby um when we they, they, because it's not easy for you to measure this way to know Okay, this is the quantity of sweat that is normal. This is the quantity of sweat that is excessive. So what I normally tell parents beyond the period when your baby is sucking and all that, if your baby is sweating when every other person is cold, for example, you are in an AC room and all that, and some of these moms as well, I forgot to mention that when the baby, they, we are always overdressing our babies, you know, in especially in Nigeria, yeah, this same baby is wearing thick clothes in an environment that is already very hot and humid. And then we see make sure they put on cap, they make sure they put on socks, they make sure they put on uh um uh maintenance and all that. So then we worry that baby are sweating excessively. Most of the time it is we that is that are predisposing our babies to this sweating so i always say about that dress will be according to the weather and there's nothing in the constitution that says the baby must always wear that cap or that it must always have socks on their feet this is not it's not in the constitution so you don't have to put a pawn on the baby's all the time if the weather is cold obviously yes i mean we are all sensible parents then you can wear additional layers but when it is hot and sunny even you yourself you are almost you know funny yourself and all that then you should not overdress our babies and then expect them not to swear so and that is why most of them come down with eat rashes because of all those overdressing over covering and all that so uh tosin i hope you are not overdressing your baby 
Two, there's something wrong with your baby sweating. So I will only worry about babies who are sweating in a very cold environment where everybody else is shivering and then they are sweating, you know. That is when it is abnormal and that is when I will say, okay, come and see us to make sure there's nothing wrong with the hormones and all those kind of things. But most of the time, there's no nothing excessive and it is just our dressing. So if you have dressed maybe over, if you have been sweating excessively and you are already wearing too much layers of clothes, take them off, take off the socks, take off this meeting, take off the, uh, the cap and let it be soak. And that is fine. And just make sure you keep the baby cool. And there's some of us believe that baby should not be exposed to fan or to AC. That is absolutely not correct. Okay. It is okay to Babies can be in a room that has AC. They can be in a room that has fan. It was one thing is regulation. Everything is moderation. So those are the things that we need to do. And all those sweating uh, issue will disappear. All right. Uh, let's go all right. on. Uh, let's go on. Okay. Thank you so much, doctor, for that. From Faith Deco. Good morning, doctor. My baby is five months plus and... Our current weight is 6.9 kg. Our birth weight was 2.8 kilogram. Please, is the weight okay according to our age? I'm a bit worried. Yeah, okay. Mothers are always worried. I think it's part of job descriptions of mothers to worry about everything. And I think it's the job of pediatricians to tell you not to worry. Okay, so the weight of your baby is fine, face. Okay, so we, like I was saying earlier, I don't know whether you were here when I was answering the question from Instagram. So there are certain uh, ways to know whether your baby's weight is okay or not. And I always like to teach mothers, <clears throat> do it yourself. You know, you can know it by yourself. So I always teach uh, rules of the term, like simple, simple things. Number one, all of you have this, your immunization card or your baby's record card. They call it by different names, depending on which, how fancy the hospital or the center you go to is. So most people just call it as immunization card. And in that card, there's a place where the nurses normally record the weights. And there's it, there's something like a graph in that cell, uh, in that card as well. So if you look at the inside of it, there's a graph. So if you plot your, some of us who still remember our maths, if you plot your baby's weights and and trace it to your baby's age, you will see it's missing. So there are some lines drawn on those graphs. So as long as your baby weight is between the two extreme line so there's a line at the top there's a line at the bottom there's a line in the middle as long as your baby's weight is in between the two last the topmost and the lowermost lines your baby's weight is fine that is it's still within normal limit if it is above the top line that means it's really high uh over the top or uh, more than what we expected if it is below the line then we begin to worry about it uh, being too low for age uh, we have many many mothers don't like uh, mass they don't like graphs they don't like all that so another method is i use a double method so maybe you should double their weight by six months and they should triple it by one year and they should quadruple it by two years so if your baby was 2.8 at birth by six months your baby should be 5.6 that is the doubling of the weight and your baby is already 6.9 so your baby is actually over the expectation so that weight is definitely okay it doesn't mean that your baby is too much so usually even for the normal normal is not one figure normal is a range so we have what we call between 80 percent to 120 percent is still within normal. So even though your B is 0.9, more than double what we expected, it's still normal. So you don't need to worry about it. And these days, many of us, technology is so easy. There are a lot of apps that you can use to check your weight of your baby. So there are a lot of apps. Just Google them on like baby's weights or, or something like that, either online on the uh, on the, like uh, your laptop or even on your phone. And you can put them in, also put the weights in, they come back straight away and tell you your baby is this percentile, is this percentile, and they tell you it's normal or not. So you don't have to worry. So for those who don't like maths, who don't like calculation, who don't like to go to graphs, just get those apps and you can usually check your baby's weight compared to what is normal and they will tell you it's normal. So there's no reason for you to worry about the weights. Okay? About the weights. Okay? Okay, thank you. So long. And from Oluwatosin, Olaumi. 
He's saying, my three-month-old loves putting her hand in her mouth even after breastfeeding. She's on explicit breastfeeding and I make sure I feed her well. So she empties both breasts. Yeah, she loves dipping her hands in her mouth, though she just started this habit. Please, what can I do? Thank you. All right. Thank you. Well, uh, that is a, a another popular question. Babies, you know, putting their hands in their mouth. And that is really an habit. Of, uh, it's more of an habit. And for different babies do it for different reasons. I'm happy you already told me oh, that you're breastfeeding your baby on time. Your baby is <laughs> empty the breast and all that. So some babies do it like sometimes they, they just randomly move their hands around them their face and then the hands get into their mouth and sucking is actually something that gives baby pleasure so this is one thing i always tell mothers about because a lot of mothers think babies like to suck and the fact that they keep sucking 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 means they are hungry and the the breast is not enough and I always tell them there are many reasons why babies suck okay sucking is not just about hunger for babies sucking is actually a way of comforting themselves as well so for example when we want to do some procedures for newborn babies what we do is actually make them suck on maybe like glucose water or something that is our way of giving them pain relief because so that's sucking itself so it can actually be a way of you know pleasuring the child and they forget the pain you know so that is so sucking is also something babies do for pleasure and that is why some of them suck on the fingers. Some of them actually suck on the fingers as a way of comforting themselves. It's a self-comforting habit, especially for babies that if you don't tend to comfort them on time when you're crying and all that, then they, they kind of learn to suck on their fingers as their own way of comforting themselves. So this is a reason why babies suck. So it's not because they are hungry. Sometimes it's for pleasure. Sometimes it's self-comforting habits. So like you said, it's an habit. So what we normally, what I normally recommend is that um you can for this three month hold usually from three months they can do a lot of things with their hands they can hold rattles and shake it and all that so give them something else to do with their hand so sometimes give them something else to do with their hands you know freeze that hand from from them being able to put it in their mouth so for a three month old i would say just put rattles you know like toys in the hands maybe we'll shake it and in that process it's very unlikely to use the hands and mouth but i know some mothers no matter what you do the babies will see always with their hands the good news is that most of them outgrow the habit so it will stop so you don't need to well i don't recommend what some people do don't go and put bitter leaf in the hands don't go and wrap it with plaster don't go and do all those things those things are really really uh dangerous and they are not even good for the baby so what you normally do is distraction method give them something else to do with the hands and also make sure that the baby do not cry too much before you uh you are in tune with their knees try and always pick up on their cues like if they want to suck and all that so that they don't tend to resolve to using the hands as their comfort or as a feeding method and all that so those are simple methods you can use but the good news is that just relax it will it will come to pass most of them actually outgrow their habits all right okay i think i'll just go to instagram we have a lot of questions that are dropping on instagram before we come back to uh, our facebook um okay uh sorry i'm scrolling through okay some okay so the first uh mr zem summary aids or something say thank you for answering my question god bless you uh, maybe he doesn't have any bad Okay, if uh, okay, that was the mom that has a question about baby being born at 35 weeks. Okay, so your baby did not have any problem at birth, is still struggling to sit down. So, like I told you, you don't need to worry about your baby sitting. Your baby is actually four months, three weeks. So, your baby should not be sitting. Sitting with support is from five to six months. So, that is why it's important for you to understand the concept of corrected age versus chronological age. So, if your baby is a preterm baby, don't judge them by their chronological age. We judge them by their uh, corrected age. That corrected age is their actual age if they have been born at nine months at the normal time. So that is what we normally, so that's why we normally calculate the corrected age. So because I've calculated your baby's corrected age and it's four months and three weeks, I'm not even worried about struggling to see your baby should not be sitting. Sitting is from five to six months and your baby should not have any teeth 
again at four months. Most babies start bringing out their teeth from five to seven months. And like I also said, some people may not even bring it out until one year and it's still uh, normal as well. All right, thank you. Uh, the next question from Instagram, Shari01 say, my seven month old baby is 10.3. Is that weight okay? So a seven month old, 10 kg is actually the weight of a one year old averagely so an, an average one year old weighs 10 kilos so if you're seven months old it's already weighing 10 kilos that's a little bit on the high side of normal so like i said uh but we're not going to worry but i just want you to keep an eye on that and make sure that you're feeding you're feeding baby right we can actually overfeed babies as well so let's not overfeed them and some i know mothers always like their babies big and chubby and plumpy and I just wanted to know, let you know that overweight is actually a problem as well. It's also malnutrition. So when we talk about malnutrition, we are not only talking about babies who are low for age, uh, whose weights are low for their age. We are also talking about babies who are obese, whose weights are too much. So it's also a form of malnutrition. So we need to make sure we're feeding our babies well. So a seven-month-old baby should be on should be taking breast milk and having maybe two to three complementary feeds a day. You know, so those are what babies should be having. Let's not be feeding them too much of the milk and the uh, the cereals all the time. You know, they are not supposed to be eating it like every three hours, that kind of thing. You know, so let's just watch. Of course, in some families, some babies are big because they are they tend to be big in that family and there's really nothing wrong. So, but we just need to keep an eye on it. Let's make sure that your pediatrician is keeping an eye because we also don't want it to go too much and then we will not start struggling with bringing it down. So that's just what I would say about that then another question from alola day see what's up by say doc you said the breast lumps will disappear with uh, which breast lump breast lump in wool in the baby or wool uh you have to be very specific i'm not sure i understand the breast lump so when you're asking question you have to put the age i'm not sure whether you're referring to a breast lump in the baby or in the mother <laughs> i don't know which one uh you were referring to so surely your baby was 2.6 at birth and your baby is already 10 kilos at seven months that is on the high side that's on the high side now maybe should just have been doubling the weights and be closer to maybe like uh, 5.2 at six months so by seven months maybe should just be about six or seven kilos so going as far as um 10 kilos is on the high side so i i, I would just want you to keep an eye on that all right, we still don't have any questions on Insta on Facebook, so I'll just continue with Instagram questions. They seem to be on fire. So I did want me to say, hello, doc. My baby is three kilos at birth and eight kg at nine months. Is the weight okay? So the average weight at nine months should be nine kilos, uh, but eight kilos is not too far from nine kg. So it's still okay, but we really need you to work on that. So that because sometimes the weight we measure it may not may still be within normal but we're already worried that if we don't do something it will keep going lower for example this baby's weight must never go below eight kilos so the next time we want to see it going higher so you need to check how are you feeding your baby complementary feeding are you doing it right so you want to go through our teachings on complementary feeding and make sure you're still breastfeeding i think most mothers when they start complementary feeding we begin to think uh breastfeeding has come to an end so breastfeeding exclusively is for the first six months but it doesn't come to an end out at six months it continues beyond six months but it's just that uh at this time we need to add of the food so that's why we call it complementary something you are adding on to breastfeeding so you are not stopping breastfeeding you are actually adding to breastfeeding so let's make sure we are still breastfeeding uh our babies so i hope that is helpful so just work on the on the feeding that's all i would say for uh are they allowing me is it are they, are they with me rather so i think that's helpful all right all right i don't think we have any questions still i don't think we have any questions still on Facebook. Okay. Let me just consider with okay. Instagram. Do we have any question on your WhatsApp or any of the your studio stuff? Any of the your studio stuff? No, no, no. 
No, okay. All right. All right. So I'll just continue with the ones I'm still having on Instagram here. Uh, I've answered it with me. L, L Faith, say good good morning. Um, my background of 10 months, I guess you mean my baby of 10 months has refused to eat any food other than pap and breast me. What can I do? Okay, so uh, um, if I don't get this question any day on, on ACP Live, then I will be surprised because it's, I think it's the most frequently asked question, maybe next to the teaching questions. Um, complimentary feeding is not pap, okay? Complimentary feeding is not pap feeding. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of mothers give breast milk and pap, and then we think we're doing feeding. That is not, pap alone is not complementary feeding. So a 10 month old who is only on pap and breast milk is not feeding appropriately. And that is a risk for malnutrition. Okay. So I, I will just try and summarize the answer, but I, I think we've done a lot of teachings on complementary feeding, uh, infant feeding for the first 1000 days. So I would recommend you watch either the video or the, you go to the podcast and listen to that as well. So, um, from six months, we need to introduce our babies to complementary feeding. And when we're introducing to complementary feeding, we need to understand the concept of food classes. So we have different kind of food groups. Uh, we, we have what we call the, uh, like the carbohydrates, they give energy. So we have different kind of them. You have the grains, like your pap, uh, the cereals, those are the grains. You also have the tubers, like your yam and your potatoes and stuff. We also have the animal giving uh, uh, or protein, uh, uh, we have um, bodybuilding food. So you have the protein, you have the animal protein, you have the plant protein. So the animal protein includes things like your egg, your fish, your meat, your chicken. Those are the animal protein. Then you have your plant protein like your beans, like your granules, and all those ones are also proteinous food. Of course, you have your dairy, which can be your breast, which can be other dairy products like your yogurts, like other milk, cheese, and all that. We also have our of welfare food or what you the fruits and the vegetables so veggies are very important you uh, all that and of course we have our fats and oil the oil the butter and the rest of that so when we're giving food to babies we must make sure we have at least four from all these groups of food i've mentioned so for example pap is just one it is just carbohydrates only from the the uh, carbohydrate group or the cereal group. So I didn't see you say you're having crayfish. I didn't see you saying you are breaking egg into it. So the, it, it, even that pap is not, it's, it, it, we can still make the pap to, to be fortified, like we tend to call it fortified pap. So we make it to have all the other food classes. So that is number one. And then we must also be conscious of variety. So you don't keep giving just one food all the time to the babies. We have to give it in variety. So if you decide that, okay, I'm going to give the pub with the crayfish, with a little bit of uh, milk in it, and with a little bit of palm oil, and mix it. And of course, it has to be thick porridge, not the pub that you're giving through the bottle. That's another mistake mothers do. We are giving complimentary feeding through bottles. So pub will give it through bottles. It's watery. You can't add any other thing to it. That is not the pub. has to be thick porridge pub prepared and given with a cup with a spoon and on from the plate so and we had other food to eat never give any complimentary feeding through bottle and then another time when it is the next meal you can decide that okay this time around i'm going to switch it around so my carbohydrate sauce will be maybe potato and then you had butter to the potato you match it very well you had um you can add the crayfish to it, or you can, you know, your normal titles fish, you can, you know, put it into small, small pieces and mix it into it and add, you know, your veggies into it, cut a little bit of vegetables and mix it into it, and you feed your child with this cup and the spoon. So you must do variety, you must mix them, and we have to start it early. And when you are offering new food, you don't just give the food one time and then you say, my baby doesn't like that food, which is what most mothers do. So you give one spoon, baby doesn't want that one spoon, then you throw that one away, then you go for the next one. No, you have to keep offering that same food at least, we say, 13 times. I usually just say mothers do it for one week. Offer it every day for one week, at least. So, and then when you are introducing new food, don't expect the baby to finish a whole bowl of them. Sometimes you just one spoon or three spoons, baby is going to take. That's fine. That doesn't mean the baby has rejected that food. 
and again quantity also matters. sometimes parents don't understand the quantity of the food that we need to eat so i always recommend people watch all our um the feeding videos have been made by global health media it's available online it's available on the hub but and beyond hub you will see how to know the quantity you need to give. So sometimes some of the quantity we expect those babies to finish, they are too much for them. So we expect them to finish the same quantity they would have finished if they are taking the liquid milk. And then we expect them to finish that same quantity as their complementary food. No, it doesn't work that way because liquid milk, they uh, it, it, because it's liquid, you need to take a lot of volume for you to get the same amount of calories. Whereas when we are doing complementary food with a smaller volume, you can get the same amount of calories. So, for example, for six to eight months old baby, we expect them to just take about half a cup, you know, half a cup of food. You know, uh, a cup is like, uh, you know, um, most of our cups are like about 100 mils or 150 mils. Maybe half a cup is about 50 to 75 mils of thick porridge or whatever uh, um, mixture we've made. Usually at that age, we give them more of semi-solid, more of porridge or mashed food. But by the time they're getting closer to one to two, we give them the real solid. So that is it. That is it. So we need to know all these things and we need to, I find that most of the time the problem is when it comes to my baby is not eating, is the fact that parents also don't have the knowledge of number one, what to give, how often to give it, how to give it, and then, you know, all the other things that go along with it. So because to say all oh, like a whole one hour <laughs> topic on its own i usually try not to answer it here because we just keep going around so what i recommend is that you can go to our facebook group or you can download the bus and beyond half because those videos are there it's also on our facebook group it's also on youtube and you can watch them first understand first how to go about complimentary feeding and please do not replace complimentary feeding with sweets and junks and biscuits and all those drinks you know that they are, the baby's not going to eat when you give them all those things so you need to know that and then you give them and even the way we present the food just be colorful use nice cutleries you know those fancy food plates and children like those kind of things they like color and they eat at the same time with the children don't let the children see eating as a punishment for them let them see that everybody is eating you are also eating that they can eat as well so we have a lot of feeding tips also on our instagram page as well so you can look at, look through them and you know you can pick one of those things but more importantly you just have to be patient as well when you're introducing new food you got to be patient you got to do it over and over again most parents just want to bring the food and they want the children to just eat it and then move on. And I always suffer, even myself as an adult, when I go to a new country and they offer me their food that I've never eaten before, of course, they are, I'm not so adventurous. I'm going to take my time learning how to eat it. The same thing with children, you've been on milk for a long time and then you're now bringing new food. Don't just expect them to jump on it. Of course, some children are very good eaters, so they jump on it straight away and that's good. But some children are not that very adventurous. So you just be patient with them and you keep introducing the food gradually and gradually. But definitely giving only milk and breast milk, uh, only pap and breast milk is not good at all. It's a recipe for malnutrition. So I want you to change that and again just remember some of these principles and do it gradually and sorry to bust all the bubbles of the mother there are no drugs we are going to give you to make your baby eat okay all of you are looking for the pediatricians to prescribe a magical drug that once you give it to your babies like this then they start eating like all the food in the world there are no drugs i can assure you of that even some people that all those drugs that they are selling to you some of you like because they know that you are going to buy them anyway so those people are just have to make money and some of those drugs are very dangerous with all the dangerous side effects so please don't buy any so-called appetite boosters or those cipreptadine and all those things they are very dangerous drugs so they are not meant for babies to make them eat, okay? They are meant for other things. So don't buy them and don't give your babies all the problems. The solution to babies not eating is still giving them food and then patience and doing it over and over and they eat it. And sometimes babies have eaten enough, but some mothers just want them to eat too much. And you think that maybe the quantity they eat is not enough and that's the problem. 
So like I said, sometimes if they take the three spoons, that's okay. And just keep offering. Then maybe the next time they will graduate to five spoons. That is it. So don't expect them to finish like a 200 mil or a whole bowl of tin for you to be satisfied. No. So you also have to understand that the concept of the quantity, the quality of uh, how we give uh, complementary food. So I hope that is uh, helpful. All right. Okay, I think I'll stop there because, like I said, that's a whole hour question. Like I said, that's a whole hour question. Okay, well, thank you very much. So, from Facebook now, please, doctor, is it possible for a big baby to reduce weight drastically? My baby girl was 4.5 at birth according to the hospital scale, but at six weeks, she was 2.8, though she was on antibiotics when she was born due to jaundice and skin reaction. But at 14 weeks, she was last week, she was 4.2. What might have made her weight drops like that in her first month? Okay, for me, I think, uh, for me, I think, uh, let me mute this thing. I, I'm, I'm not sure that birth weight was correct. I'm not sure. I have a, I, I, I will, well, there are many possibilities for what could have happened to your baby. Of course, baby can lose weight, but they will not lose half of their birth weight. I mean, um, well, yeah. Yeah, no, like almost half of the birth weights are in the first four weeks of life. Very unlikely. So it's either that weight was not measured properly because people do right. People do make human errors. People do make mistakes. So if your baby was uh, 4.5 at birth, number one, how was your delivery? Was your delivery stressful? Because if you're, if you're a mom and you're having a baby of 4.5, that's a very big baby. That baby is difficult to push out. So that baby, most of them require cesarean section or you would have had a very large episode to me. So if you didn't have all that, and how did your baby look at, even when you carry the baby, was the baby looking that very big now compared to how your baby look at four weeks? So it is not just even what the weight says it's also what how you look at your baby when you carry your baby then and now and at that four weeks you can you yourself look and see that significant changes so if you can look and see that significant changes it's most likely the first documentation of the birth weight may have been wrong and that's my own uh god uh god feeling about it that maybe it was a women hero about the weights okay so I, I worry about that of course you may be having jaundice or maybe was sick um that would also have dropped the weights but i'm not so sure but those are the possibilities it's either the error in measurement or they maybe could actually lose weight but then even that jaundice and all those things i'm not sure they're going to have the weight that is actually it was that is actually on the on the on oh, very improbable you know unless you're not feeding the baby at all and i doubt the baby was in the hospital so they must have been feeding the baby so that is uh, number one so your baby is now 14 weeks at least your baby is gaining weight since your baby is now 4.2 so that's good so i will encourage you to exclusively breastfeed your baby and keep monitoring the weight as well and the most important thing is that your baby is now gaining weight rather than losing the weight all right i hope that's helpful uh, but the best people to ask actually are the doctors who uh, manage your baby who um, okay, my five months baby has blood nose since two weeks, and now she's five months and the nose has not clear. I'm not sure I understand blood nose is, is the baby uh bleeding nose bleeding because there are two different nose because what do you mean by nose that's not clear and when you say blood nose is or do you mean blocked i guess you want to write blocked because i don't think a baby can have bleed nose bleeding for two weeks continuously i mean that will worry us so um uh when you see china yeah can you just quickly clarify so that we don't answer the wrong questions okay so if this is a blocked nose which is what i'm suspecting uh you know babies can have that from if they have respiratory infections and all that so um usually what we normally recommend is that you put saline drops 
That's a normal saline. You can drop it into the nose. It will soften the mucus and it will clear out. So that's number one. But if it is more than two weeks, I really recommend you see a doctor because we need to be sure um, that there's something else going on. Usually, usually by two weeks, most respiratory infections that are due to viruses should have cleared. So if it is still blocked at two weeks, then I really want you to see a doctor. Then just to quickly say that sometimes what parents call blocked nose is actually not blocked nose. Uh, because sometimes we make all these funny sounds and parents think that funny sound means the nose is blocked. Like, they make all this sign. You say, well, maybe there's some kata there or not. But if you don't see the kata, if you don't see any mucus in the nose, it is not blocked nose, okay? There are many reasons why baby makes sounds. And some of those sounds, uh, some, some could be normal, some could be abnormal, okay? But we really need to know which one it is. So I will recommend that you, you, you see a doctor first. But if you don't see any mucus in the nose itself, then please do not um, start putting saline in the nose. But if you can see the mucus, but the mucus is not coming out and it's appearing the nose is blocked, if you put normal saline, they sell the saline drops in the pharmacy and you don't need a prescription to buy it. If you put a drop in the nose, yeah, maybe three times a day, it will soften the mucus. The mucus will flow out and you can just clean it. And most of the time, there are viral infection. You don't need to give antibiotics. You don't need to give any other treatment and it will clear away. All right, but if your baby is bleeding from the nose because what you wrote is actually blood, then please you need to see a doctor quickly. If your baby, I don't, I don't want to believe your baby is bleeding for two weeks from the nose, but if that's the case, we see a doctor. Okay, our time is running up. Let me just finish the ones that are in the Instagram, and then we can round up for the day. All right, the next question is the Olalali was saying my baby has breast lump okay yeah okay i remember if uh uh your baby has um uh breast lump since two months ago your six month old baby okay so some babies are born and they have the breast enlargement okay that is different from breast lump their breast is swollen okay um and when their breast is swollen it's due to the effect of the hormones of your hormones as a mother in the baby's blood so the same hormones that make you to have enlarged breasts so that you can breastfeed can also have effect on the baby's breast as well and baby's breast will be big and fast and that and then bring out milk as well so what we normally see is that just leave it alone now don't worry about it may take several months for it to go away so you but it will eventually resolve on its own please do not press it do not massage it because when you are doing that that is when you create problems because you can introduce infection into the breast in maybe kind of have what we call breast uh, uh, infection mastitis or even an abscess and then we now have to remove the 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 the, uh, the pulse and all that that's another stressful situation for the baby we have to give antibiotics we have to do a minor operation and remove out the pulse so but the breast itself just leave it alone don't massage it don't press it just Leave it alone. And I'm, I, we can't tell you exactly when it's going to resolve because it varies from one baby to another baby, but you can trust that it will resolve eventually on its own, but it can take several months. There's no reason for you to worry about it. Just ignore it. Just leave it alone. It's not giving the baby any harm. All right. I didn't want me to say, can I give cheese balls and biscuits to your 10 months old baby? No. Okay. This is exactly what I'm talking about. This is the same. Is it the same baby that was not eating well? Or is it the baby that was overweight? Uh, let me go back. <laughs> okay. But please do not, let's not give junk food to our babies at all. Let's not give junk food to the babies. Uh, let's avoid it. Give them LD snacks. Okay. LD snacks are fruits. And the snacks are uh, your akara balls, your moi moi, your coros, your banana. At that 10 months old, they can they are now finger feeding, so they can hold the banana in their hands, they can hold an egg in their hands, they can, you know, hold you know things that they can hold in their hands. And please go for healthy snacks. Let's not give all these biscuit cheese balls. Most of them are just uh loads of sugar and fats and salts 
they don't do any good for the baby and they are very sweet and babies like them so then they all all they want to eat is biscuits and tea and then they don't want to eat normal food and then we are back to square one so please babies don't need all those junks i don't know why mothers always give it to them but they don't need all those chunks at all. So please do not uh, give it to them. I was looking for they will means for my questions. <laughs> so I'm I'm trying to reconcile the two questions together. Yeah, your baby is the one that was eight kilos. No, so your solution is not giving your baby biscuits and junk food. Your baby is giving normal food and healthy uh, snacks. Okay. All uh, right, let me go back to so I don't mean to. I'll recommend you go through our complimentary feeding. We actually actually have a video on what not to give as well. So that is where you get the answer to your own questions as well. Uh okay, she figures say my three-year-old daughter suddenly pee on herself when I asked her why. She said she couldn't hold it. It happens like once a day, not all the time. So for your three-year-old, you need to remind them to go to the bedroom. Uh, some of them, they are used to maybe when they are playing, so they have the urge, then they don't want to go because they are enjoying the game or whatever they are doing. And then they keep holding it to the last minute. And then suddenly at the last minute, they realize they can't, they can't make it quickly enough to the bedroom and then they pee on themselves. So what you need to do is to remind her to go to the bedroom frequently. So like every two hours or every three hours, you know, can you just go and pee? So they just get used to going to the bedroom regularly and not waiting to the last minute so that's a, so if it's just once in a while i think that is what is happening if it is happening frequently then sometimes some children have what we call urgency or frequency which sometimes there are signs of urinary tract infections and for those ones you really need to take them to the hospital okay it's our time is up just two minutes to round up it be it be with joanna say uh, good morning, doctor. My children, less than two years, need antitetanus anytime they have a cut. It depends on the kind of a cut they have. If it's a clean cut, we don't always have to give them tetanus dogs, right? If it's a dirty wound that could likely have been contaminated, yes, we have to give it to them. And the final question by Shiva Girl say, My three months old daughter sees her arm and leg when being picked up, and she can't reach for a toy. Um, she was born through a CS and cried immediately. I'm so scared of taking her to the hospital. Uh, why? Anyway, I, I know I can understand why you could be scared, but then we still need to know what is wrong here. So I normally, for this kind of baby, I really want to see a picture. I really want to see a video of what you are describing to me because she said she's stiff in her hands and her legs when being picked up. Does she stiff in her hands and legs when you don't pick her up as well? Because, I mean, usually for seizures, children don't do it when things are happening. They do it even when things are not happening. So it's not something voluntary. So what you are describing look like something voluntary. So, but then I'm wondering why she has to do that. Well, what do you really mean by that? Is it that you mean that the baby is stiff? You know, because there are many things that could be going on here. A three months old baby, um, they should have neck control. I'm not really worried whether they are reaching out for toys at three months old. I really want that at six months old, really. We give some gap for every baby and all that. But that Stephanie, I worry about it. And I really, really think you want to see a pediatrician about that. Don't be scared. It's, it may be nothing. And it's better for us to see you and tell you there's nothing than for you to worry and there is something. Okay, our time is gone. So all those who have gone, so all those who have please uh, post your questions to our Facebook group from Monday to Saturday and we will answer them. Thank you so much. Back to Esther. <laughs> Back to Esther. Yeah, thank you very much, man. It's a pleasure to have a life and we are grateful. We are grateful. So to so all of our listeners, thank you for joining us today. ATPR is always live on Fresh Race Radio every Thursday, the same time 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. West African time on www.freshraceradio.com. And it's also live on Facebook, so you can always watch and listen. So thank you very much, Ma. Thank you. We are grateful. Bye. Bye. Thank, thank you for joining us. Bye. Bye. Thank Bye. you.